And we're playing Tijuna. Okay, well, we're going to play another King's Indian. Since I just spent so long talking about it, we might as well play it. Thank you, everybody, once again for the tremendous support and all these subs and all the hype. It's, it's awesome. Okay, so this guy plays the main line. And I'm actually going to play a very interesting line that I myself like to play. That's the movie E takes D4. So in effect, we've gotten the Morozzi bind structure from the last game. But there's one key difference. I have the pawn on C7 rather than on E7. What difference does that make? Well, that gives me a direct line of fire to the E4 pawn. How do I build on that direct line of fire? What breakthrough can I prepare? And this is also the main line. Thank you, Yoaguan21. What is the sort of typical idea? C65, that's the main line. Now, knight C6 there is also possible. But the move c6 is the sort of combative line. King h1, he knows the, the best move. Now, what we're supposed to do here is go knight out to h5. This should not surprise anybody who's been paying attention to uh, the previous King's Indian game. This opens up possibilities like queen h4. And it opens up one more very important possibility. He's put his bishop on a square where it's type 1 undefended. We have a rook on e8 that's x-raying it. How could we combine the two? Bring those together, f5, bingo. We want to drive this pawn into f4 that creates a stronghold for the knight on g3. And I'll explain how to use that, assuming he doesn't go crazy here. Okay, so he's prevented f4. We ask ourselves straight away the Sam Shankland question. What happens if we do it anyway? Can we play f4 anyway? Yes or no? No, says Misosupio. We can. Because if he takes it, then we take. And then he takes it, he drops his knight on d4. Now the typical move is to centralize our bishop on e5. It's a nice central outpost. And there is a particular sacrifice here that we are beginning to eye. And we actually can apply it immediately. What, what am I talking about? This is a very, very typical idea in this position. It's not d5 anymore. He's clamped down on that. It is the move knight to g3 check. After the game, I will unpack this properly. So it may seem that we should take the rook on f1. But here's the thing, guys, and I'm going to blow your mind. Um, taking the rook is what I would do against another grandmaster. But we are going to go for checkmate, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to try to apply... Okay, well, he's actually going to prevent it, sort of. Hmm, let me think. Yeah, so bishop d4 was a really, really good move. And I will explain everything after the game, but let us take the exchange so that we don't forfeit this opportunity. Now, we've won the exchange, and we need to abide by the key principle that I always talk about, which is that when you've won material, the number one cause of disaster after winning material is to forget to continue applying basic principles such as continuing your development so let's not forget to continue our the best move here for him would be c5 but he helps us out by trading pieces get, get cementing our pawn structure all we need to do here to consolidate our advantage is to develop the knight bring the rook to d8 can we do that here or do we need to defend the pawn can we do both what should black do here take a moment to tell me the best move in this position Knight d7 anyway, exactly. And we can always smoke this queen out by playing queen to e7. In fact, that's what we're going to do on the next move. Yeah. We're up in exchange. He goes queen c7. He's going hunting for our pawns. Um, hmm, that's actually a very good move. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go queen to d8. Wait a minute, Daniel. You're blundering the pawn. No. I'm, oh, he takes the queen. Thank you. What would I have done against queen b7 i was planning to trade queens with queen b6 okay now those of you who are paying very careful attention well what should we do where should we put this knight those of you paying attention to the previous king's indian game should now know that nothing happened to this idea we're threatening a check on d2 which would win the knight and how can we cement the knight who would like to remind me okay well he's i don't think he's aware 
that he's down in exchange. And we're going to put the other rook on d8. We can always play a5 to prevent him from chasing our knight away. In fact, that is what we are going to do. Just because it's an end game doesn't mean that the typical middle game ideas don't apply. Let's not forget now to bring our king into the picture. If he goes a3, how do we... Well, and now let's begin to attack the king side. Same... We're playing this as if it's a middle game because the same ideas apply uh, other than bringing our king into the game, which... Uh, so because the same ideas apply, how do we proceed on the king side? What do we do? Look at this position. It's like a textbook King's Indian position. That's c6 pawn protecting d5. Absolutely. We should push the pawn. Now, this does a couple things. It breaks through. We have a pathway, should we want it, for the king to get all the way to g3. That would be sort of the, like, Russian school of... But, we, we'll, but instead, we'll go g3. But aren't you locking up the position? Isn't that good for white? Actually, no. I want you guys to pay very careful attention to the g2 pawn. Some of you, I know, are tempted by this move. It doesn't work. Let's find a more methodical way to, to uh, apply pressure on that pawn. What should we do? How, how do we maneuver one of our pieces, which has already done its job on its current location? And that's another key thing. I, this is flexibility of thinking. Oftentimes, people get like almost emotionally attached to like the placement of one particular piece, but you got to understand that it's done its job. And now... We always remember to look at the undefended pieces. The knight on c2 is undefended. We also pay attention to the x-rays. And as you guys, beautiful job, guys. Bishop h3, textbook style idea, forcing the pawn out. Then we're going to take the knight and promote our pawn or force him to give up his bishop for it. The game is over. Yep, you guys are uh, very, very sharp at this ungodly hour. And uh, I love to see it. So that just ends the game. Okay, well, here, we just take on g2. And, okay, knight g1 doesn't actually attack anything, so we can just take. And um, now the knight is lost. Boom. Over. We're going to send our knight forward and check mid him or promote our pawn one of many ways, and he resigns. Very nice game. And uh, sort of clearly showed the king's Indian ideas. Now, king h1 is a good prophylactic move, right? Because he's getting his king out from potential ideas like this. The best move here for white is to go g4. And this is theory. This sends the knight back to f6, which is what I had planned to do, right? It weakens the king side. But white has this crazy knight f5 knight sacrifice, which um, which Gelfond actually developed a couple years ago. And this has thrown very serious doubts. Thank you, Sidon, for five bucks. This has thrown very serious doubts on the sort of objective value of this line. There's a lot of analysis here, but by and large, uh, Gelfond won a very nice game here. And uh, to that, to this date, this line hasn't really recovered. But this is kind of what I'm saying, right? Just because it's not viable at a grandmaster level doesn't mean you shouldn't play it. And I want to make that very clear. So F5, very typical idea. And to show you guys, um, what I had planned to do, so knight g3 check actually is simple. If he takes, we take, and we create a direct avenue to his king. So this is like the most classical mate in history. Now, um, to show you guys why I didn't take the rook, what is the ultimate purpose of queen h4, I want to show you guys a game against a very strong player. And let's see if I can pull this off quickly because it was played on Lee Chess and... Um, I need to actually find this game and download it into chess space. So let me see. And this was against Jan Christoph Duda. That's why I really wanted to find this game because it was against Jan Christoph Duda. In my match against him, Naroditsky versus the world, Duda, July, 2020, here we go. So guess which line it was, this line, King H1. So I played knight a6 in this game, um, which is sort of a, a rare line that I that I experimented on. And Duda, believe it or not, he missed exactly the same idea that we applied in this game. In fact, this game was almost identical to the game we just played. f5, same thing, queen d2. Can we play f4? Yes, we can. Same thing, bishop e 5 Literally the same moves. Rook fd1, knight g3 anyway. It's not a fork anymore, but it doesn't matter. If he takes, we take. It's the same concept. 
King H King G1, Queen H4. Rook AB1, Rook F8. Now, could somebody tell me what is the idea of this move? And this is exactly what I was trying to do during uh, during my game, but my opponent kind of put an end to it. What are we doing? Why do we put the rook on f6? Yeah, rook f6, b5, g5. And b takes a6. He simply failed to see the idea. Well, he played bishop f1, thinking that he prevents rook h6 due to h3. But no, what do we do? Boom, and he resigned. And he simply forgot to check the other order. Because this is checkmate. So again, always, 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 two move line, check the move order. What if you do the second thing first? Even if it's a queen sacrifice, you have to do that. And that wins the game. So that's where this all came from. I've had other games like this, but because this was against Duda, I wanted to show this sort of specifically. Okay. So bishop d4, here I decided to take. Now, why does this not work? Because he's got the f2 square. This entire operation wouldn't have worked because the king has the evacuation square. So bishop e6, he does all of our bidding for us, knight d7. Just the only thing I'll point out here, if he takes b7, I can go rook b8, takes b2. That probably would have been even better. But my original inclination was to use that technique I mentioned, right? Giving up a pawn strategically to trade queens. Maybe not the best, but really the simplest. Um, and I mentioned that you have to be careful about that. So we just deploy the knight, we stop before, and then we just attack the, the king. So everything here I explained during the game, I think everybody understands. Bishop h3 is the traditional sort of classical idea, breaking through, and the game is over. And we are white against Roy Christian 224. Let's go with an e4. Yeah, we'll free the plebs after the game. Okay, so let's continue playing the c3 Sicilian. I've sort of stuck to this as my main opening against the Sicilian. And, and he actually goes here. So we have a fundamental choice here. We can go for an advanced French. Uh, we can go for an advanced French. But I think it's more thematic to actually take on d5. Uh, because this is more in the spirit of the c3 Sicilian. Now we should develop our knight. This is following the famous game Hess Naroditsky. And knight f6 deviates from that game. So how should we think about this position? Well, I have a choice of capturing on c5. And that leads to a structure called the IQP, isolated queen pawn. And as I've repeated many times in the IQP, there's a couple of important things. The first is to, to defend the square in front of the pawn. And we kind of have that under control. But the other thing is trades are usually good for the side that defends against the IQP. So here we're going to develop our bishop with tempo. And we're going to continue developing with castle. And what we're doing is we're waiting for him to move his bishop out. And only when he moves his bishop out, do we do what? We save a lot of time. In fact, we wake make him waste time, what do we do only after he moves his bishop, which he just did? W what is it finally time for us to now do? Now we take the pawn so that we force his bishop to move twice. In fact, he doesn't take. What can we now do? There's actually several ways to preserve the extra pawn. What's the most sort of thematic way? And because we have most of our pieces developed, we shouldn't be afraid of a move like a5, right? Because we have our pieces developed. We don't actually need to do anything. We don't need to play a3. We can simply proceed with our development. We can grab the d4 square, but we sort of have that square under control. So what I'm going to do is actually go bishop to b2. And it, it, this move may look kind of weird to some of you guys because the bishop looks lame. I will explain it after. Well, I don't actually need to explain it. As you can see, that was the whole idea. Had We basically are preparing for him to take... Whoa. Uh, okay. Okay, so he just gives up a... Peace. Great. Uh, all right. Well, uh, there's nothing we can do about that. So let's actually develop our knight to d2 in order not to block the bishop's control over the long diagonal. Knight b to d2. Okay. Now this may, may look like we blundered, right? He skewers the bishops. And we don't need to panic by taking on f6. How can we protect this bishop in the most robust way? There's several ways to do it. We can go a4. And that's what we're going to do. We could have also gone queen b3. But I appreciate that people are following the rule of defending pieces with pawns. Now let's let's throw an h3 to make some luft for the king. And now I'm actually quite annoyed at the fact that we're pinned. Let's unpin ourselves by playing queen b3. Now we can we don't have to worry about this because the bishop is so robustly defended that there's no way that he can exploit this uh, standoff. In fact, we are the only ones who could exploit it. Okay, knight e4. He's trying to stir up chaos, which is 
exactly what you should do when you're down a lot of material. Now, what does this move specifically accomplish? Well, he's piling up on the f2 square with three different pieces. So we should absolutely take the knight. Queen takes d5 was a little bit more complicated there. And where should we put this knight? Who can tell me? In the spirit of playing actively, where should we plant this knight? What is a nice central square where the knight is safely protected? Absolutely. Now, where is the knight threatening to go? Knight d2 would be a little bit passive. And, and this is actually quite an important moment. A lot of people get in trouble because they play passively when they're up material. Now we're threatening to go to d7, as you guys see, but not anymore he stops it because then he takes on d7. Our queen is unprotected. Very important to recognize that. So what should we do in a situation like this? Well, our default should always be to bring pieces into the game. and But our secondary default should be to ask ourselves what he wants. He wants to plant a rook on d2. You guys see that? If we put a rook on d1, you guys are all forgetting the fact that the bishop is on h5. But because we're up a piece, right, we don't need to bring the rook in immediately. There's no urgency in doing that. So what do we do here? Who can give me a move? There is one particular sexy move that I'm thinking of, and that is the move queen swings over to g3. And I'm going to play it a little bit fast because... Um, we're, we're a little short of time. Well, what am I doing? As you guys can probably see, I am x-raying the g7 pawn. I'm inviting his bishop back. Let's, well, we don't actually need to take the bishop, but what move is now possible? Previously was impossible, but how has the position changed? Ah, he's moved the bishop back. Not knight d7, but rook ad1. Knight d7, and there are some tactical details here to, uh, to talk about. Knight d7, there was a tactical mistake inherent in that move so we're just going to take the pawn and between h2 and h1 king h2 would potentially bring the king and the queen to the same diagonal i don't like the tactical ramifications of that so i'm going to play king h1 in case he takes on e3 you see taking care of your future self now does that mean I, he literally would have put a bishop on f4 probably not but why risk it you see what i'm saying now we're completely winning we have all of our pieces and finally we are threatening knight to d7 depending on what he does. I don't really even see a good way for him to stop it. He gives up this rook. Uh, but I actually prefer to keep the bishop on the board. It's such a strong piece that let's actually take the other rook. Not only is it going to YouTube, but those of you who are kind of not following, um, you know, I prepared you for this. We're at a relatively high rating. So I'll explain everything in great detail after the game. Uh, and again, prepare with your questions. I'm here to answer questions. I'm not frustrated at them. Okay, who can propose for me a approach to winning the game? And let's play this by the book. Queen d6 is great. By the book, activate your pieces. Okay, queen to d6. What are we threatening specifically? Well, bishop c5. That's a good move. He drops his bishop back. Where can we put our queen? Where can we put our queen? Let's put it on e5. Let's induce a weakness. Let's, now, obviously, I don't think I'm under no illusions that he's going to blunder check me. That's not the point. The point is that I'm inducing a weakness. And now I'm going I'm to do something quite beautiful. We're going to give him a check. Okay, guys? And now we have a beautiful win. Who can find it? Here's what I'm seeing. His king is out of squares, which means that if we can rip apart this diagonal, this will be checkmate. Boom goes the dynamite. Rook takes f6. And that is a theme which I saw most famously in one of Harry Nelson Pillsbury's games, 19th century American master. He had a very famous game that ended in very, very similar fashion. I'll see if I can find it after the game. And uh, he sacrificed the queen similarly. Now, here we can do a bunch of different things, um, but we need to be careful. And, and one of them is if we take on e8 and go rook f8, remember that that square is protected. If we go rook f8, he takes with a bishop. But what we can do is play rook takes g6. What am I doing? The same idea as rook f8. This is a discovered attack on the pawn. The only difference is uh, we're not inviting his bishop to go to f8. I'll, I'll, I'll spell all this out after the game. And actually, the Pillsbury game, I don't really need to track it down. It's a classic game where there was a very similar concept. Uh, it, it's not anything to write home about. And that is a pretty sex nomination to end the game. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing with me that this is, in fact, quite sexy. No, oh, the snipers are the snipers are real. 
I mean, 18 seconds is enough because it's made in two at the most. Let's see if he can allow us to sacrifice our queen. If he goes bishop f8, we can take on g7 of the queen and it's checkmate. And he resigns. Nice game. Okay, let's analyze. So, to be clear in the opening, we can play the move e5. And if you know that your opponent doesn't play the French, and you do play the advanced French, this would be a sensible move. Because you would be in territory that is familiar to you, and your opponent would be in unfamiliar territory. I don't happen to play the advanced French, and I don't know this guy. Maybe he does play the French. So, I decided to keep the spirit of the elephant. Thank you, Rakavich. Now, he t we take, he takes... We develop our knight against Robert. I played the move c4. Um, you can find in the VODs my analysis of that game. Two more subs, Alhor69 and A Tizzle. Thank you. Let's go, uh, let's release the plebs. Let's release the plebs. Um, all right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the subs. Welcome. Okay. You guys are now welcome to ask questions. So here he goes, knight f6. That's the main line. And actually, I think knight bd7 is quite inaccurate. Uh, knight bd7 is quite inaccurate. But let's please focus back on the game, okay? Okay. Uh, so knight bd7 is inaccurate. Why? Because he blocks the development of his own bishop. If he goes bishop d7, that's the theoretical move. I would have taken. And then I would have castled. And you get a position like this, where, you know, I think white has a minuscule edge. Uh... And who can tell me why that is? When you're looking at this position, and black is an isolated queen's pawn, what critical factor do you have to look for in any IQP position? What specific thing uh, dictates oftentimes who's in charge? Yes, exactly. So who has control of the square in front of the pawn? Here, clearly, the answer is white. I'm basically in charge of that square. But black is very solid. I'm not really attacking the pawn itself. So if white does have an edge, it's very, very minuscule. So anyways, he goes knight bd7, we castle first. We get him to move his bishop, and only then do we take d takes c5. Forcing him to waste time taking with the bishop. He decides to give that pawn up entirely. Here we would have given a check. And isolated queen's pawn. And here we could have stopped him from castling with queen e2, among other things. And uh, this is a very nasty situation for black. Because he has a very hard time completing his development. That's how bad these things can get. Okay, so he castles, we defend. A5, bishop, b2. This is moment number one. Uh, those of you who are around for my explanation of potential energy should... Yeah, pawn c6 would have been good. Should have... Um, oh, knight takes c5 was impossible, the knight was pinned. Should kind of understand this move. What I'm doing is I'm gearing up. I'm a niche gearing up for a takes b4. I'm anticipating that this will happen. Okay, and when this happens, and it did, my bishop is tremendously strong. It's on the long diagonal. Now, you might ask, well, what if it doesn't happen? Well, if it doesn't happen, then the bishop is still okay. Uh, like I always say, you don't need every one of your pieces to, to be scaling Mount Everest at any given moment. Uh, we're also just connecting our rooks and getting our piece out. And um, I didn't see a particularly good other square for the bishop. I guess we could have put it on f4, but one thing I was kind of, kind of worried about is uh, leaving this diagonal unattended. And I was a little bit worried about a scenario where he gets, uh, let's say, a bishop to f6. You guys can see, right, how that could be a little bit nasty. So I decided to prophylactically put my own bishop on b2, even if he doesn't take on b4. I'm discouraging him from trying to get something on the long diagonal. All right, that's it's more of a prophylactic move. He takes and he plays a very weird move, knight takes c5. If he tried to undermine my pawn chain, I would have, of course, played c6. That's kind of the point. Black is in, in huge trouble here down a pawn, and I've got an amazing position. Now, the rest is quite simple. A4, defending the bishop. And let's fast forward to the cool part. Now, a lot of people here have a tendency to go backward, knight d2. Very passive. And this allows e3. Um, and, and that's kind of a nasty move. So, knight takes d, uh, queen takes d5 would have been, I think, inferior because it would have allowed a lot of complications. Uh related to bishop takes f2 check i'm sure that white is still winning here probably i can skirt around these checks but why allow all of these complications particularly since we're up a piece uh and and you don't want to take that too far sometimes you have to allow complications but uh there are other times when you can make a judgment call and decide that oops sorry there are other times when you can make a judgment call and decide that um you don't need this okay you need to consider the alternative so knight takes c4 is what i did just to keep things simple 
95 centralizing the knight. And now, knight d7. Why is this wrong? Because the rook takes d7. And I can't take because the queen is undefended. How would you see that? You would see that because I've already reminded people to always check for undefended pieces, particularly standoffs. This is a queen standoff. And standoffs are, you know, hotbeds of tactics, particularly when one of the pieces is is, is undefended. Um, okay, and so that's how we would kind of note this down. So therefore, we moved our queen away from the standoff. I didn't want it. And while we're doing it, we create more pressure on the g7 pawn. He drops his bishop back. We don't need to take the bishop. Our knight is very, very strong here. We don't need to rush to trade. Now we go rook ad1. e3 is no longer dangerous because he's got no pieces to follow this up with. And why not knight d7 in this position? Guess what? We moved our queen away. The bishop on b2 is still undefended, and we still have to have to note that down. He plays rook takes d7, and he gets two pieces for a rook, which is, we're still better, but we're only up in exchange now. No need for that. Therefore, we go rook ad1 in order to prepare this move and bring our rook to an open file. Okay, now knight d7 finally. Take the rook. Uh, queen d6, queen back to e5, attacking g7. Check. And now the key concept. Why didn't I take the bishop on e3? Because it was protected by the, the queen on a7. It was basically protecting that square. Uh, and here, I noticed that the king is out of squares. You actually, that's something a lot of people don't, I think, do, is detect situations where the king simply has no squares. I know that sounds very obvious, but you need to categorize that scenario in your mind because in that scenario, if you open up more diagonals and files, it's very likely that there's going to be some sort of checkmating ideas. That's exactly what we kind of thought of here. Uh, king has no squares to escape, so that if we can open up this diagonal, it's going to be checkmate. And the most obvious way of opening the diagonal is simply to crash through on f6. Takes, takes, and bishop takes f6. Doesn't queen takes f6 lead to the same mate? Actually, yeah, so queen f6 is working, but it's actually not that simple because what you should be afraid of and what you should not assume is that he has to recapture. Here, he doesn't have to recapture the rook. Whereas if you start by this move, he's basically compelled to capture the queen because you're also threatening checkmate. However, if we take with the queen, what should white do in this position instead of taking the rook? This speaks to the concept of tactical flexibility, always paying attention uh, to the other tactical ideas in the position, not just tunnel visioning, check, bishop f8, and now using the x-ray to deliver checkmate. That wins the game. So he won't, he goes rook e8, and now rook f8 is very tempting. I thought of this initially, but it doesn't work because bishop takes f8, and the bishop simultaneously defends the pawn on g7. Um, and hopefully that makes sense. But, but the idea is correct, right? We, we need to expose the queen's attack on g7. That's fine. Uh, th th that is fine, but we need to find the best way to do that. And the key observation is that the rook can't move away from the e-file. He's not actually really threatening to take our queen. Uh, he actually is because the e8 square is covered. But by taking on g6, we chop the legs off from that. And so this is going to be checkmate. Okay, so we use logical thinking in this way. We don't jump to conclusions. We don't make the move that kind of looks right. We, we specifically... Okay, um, let's uh, take care of that. Thank you. Uh, we specifically, um, you know, look for stuff. Thank you. A look for stuff rather than trying to, ah, this is what would be in a tactics book kind of stuff. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Hinoe, thank you for the prime. Was knight c7 a decent alternative to knight e5? Um, I'm not sure which move you're referring to because knight c7 was this square. Why are we taking the bishop instead of rook on e8? Um, well, we didn't. Also not sure what's referred to, but rook, bishop takes e8. I didn't want to give away this bishop. I, I didn't want to give away this very, very important bishop on b2. I wanted to take the better rook. Uh, of course, this is completely winning, but I, I wanted to be precise, as precise as possible. All right, guys. Um, we can ignore stuff like that. Okay. Um, back to the... Da. How do you save your games? Well, they're auto-saved. When was his bishop on h2? Why couldn't you play bishop e2? Well, bishop e2 where? 
Well, bishop e2 was, was unnecessary, right? And it would also drop this bishop. How do you know which pieces to keep and which to do? Well, that's what I'm trying to illustrate through the lens of the speed route. Why did his bishop have to leave h5? Because we were x-raying the pawn. If he makes a random move, we can move our knight away, attack his queen, and simultaneously threaten checkmate. He can defend both with queen g6, but now he ends up dropping his bishop or his rook. So that was basically why he went bishop g6. It's probably not the best move, but he's already basically busted. Uh, yeah, you can play knight c4, but uh, why, why move the knight away from its most active post? You know, why help him uh, beef up the king's side security? So uh, there's really no need, no need for that move. I know it's tempting to attack his queen, but ask yourself, is that piece uh, in the resulting position going to be worth moving there in the first place? And the answer here is kind of no. I'm going to end the stream for five seconds, and then I will restart, okay? So I'm about to end my stream for five seconds, and then I will restart it, okay? Disconnecting in three, two...